thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Chawla and Charlie for their kind invite. It's, it's always an absolute pleasure to speak at this meeting. Um, and um, good evening. It's, it, it's morning time in the UK. Uh, what I'm going to be doing today is to <clears throat> give a kind of um, what I call more than a direction, which I will try to do is to some food for thought. Uh, or what I would call lateral thinking about uh, how we diagnose diabetes, especially in what we call a South Asian or, a, or an Indian uh, population with diabetes, and how best we could, we could, we could use the emerging technology uh, to, help us, uh, to help us to do that. <laughs> So we all know this is the 100th year of, of, of the insulin discovery or, or, or from the time the first patient was given insulin. And, and, and we have made some really good advances when it comes to the evolution of diabetes therapies. And every time, every six months to a year, the guidelines are being updated and, and that's a good thing. So when it comes to management of diabetes, I think there has been a lot of, lot of progress. But when it comes to diagnosing diabetes, I think we are still in, 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 a, in a bit of a primitive era where we classify diabetes into type 1 and type 2. And in most cases, so once the diagnosis is, is probably made in the primary care and the marker we use is a surrogate marker. So once the glucose levels are more than 7 or an HbA1c of more than 6.5, the patient has is is classified as, as 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 having diabetes. Now let us try and understand the hormone that is involved in 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 in, in diabetes. So we know that the beta cells secrete what is called as the pre or pre pro insulin, and that is actually stored in the beta cells as pro insulin. And just before the insulin is released it is cleaved into the active form, the, the insulin and from, from the beta chain, and you have got this small peptide released into the blood, which is called, which is called the C-peptide. And this is something which is very important for us to understand and elude the role of insulin. Now, whenever I talk about C-peptide, one of the students uh, ask me, my medical students, why is insulin stored at pro, as pro-insulin? And, and the reason is simple. If the body stores it as insulin and it is released, it will start causing hypoglycemia in normal people. So therefore, the pro-insulin is, is an inactive form of insulin. Uh, and when it is released, the insulin C-peptide go in. And this is what the C-peptide looks like. So it's a cleavage product of pro-insulin. -pro and compared with insulin, it's got a longer half life. Now, one of the one of the pitfalls of measuring insulin in the blood is that first of all, insulin is a very unstable uh, uh, hormone to measure in the blood. Most of the assays of the insulin are extremely noisy, and secondly, the insulin actually goes into the cells very quickly. So therefore, it becomes very difficult to measure insulin. Or whenever you measure it, for mostly for research purposes, you get all kinds of all kinds of numbers. So compared with insulin, C peptide has a longer half life, more stable, and it doesn't go through the first pass metabolism as insulin does. And it's an established marker now of beta cell function. Now, this is a <clears throat> quote that was um, first mentioned by one of uh, my endocrine colleagues uh, who does a lot of pituitary, and I thought this is something very important. The diabetologists are those endocrinologists that do not measure the hormone that they are treating. And for the most endocrinologists, this will be sacrilegious. Imagine treating hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism without measuring the thyroid hormone or Cushing's without the steroids. But as I said, most of the diabetologists 
we are using a surrogate marker, be it HbA1c or glucose, not only to diagnose our patients and to also direct the treatments for them. Now, let us understand that why this becomes more important in an Indian population with diabetes. Now, this was an excellent review by, by, by my good friend, Kim Narayanan, and in diabetes care. And this is a comparison between what he called the tale of two Indians. So one are the Pima Indians, and the Pima Indians are the classical model that has been used in the West to study diabetes. And the second model is the Asian Indians, and this is, this, uh, this is a kind of a cohort from Chennai. Both these populations have got a very high prevalence of diabetes, or greater than 50% by the age of 55 years. But their obesity profiles are very different. The Pima Indians are very obese, while Asian Indians are relatively thinner. The Pima Indians have got a higher 2R plasma glucose, while the Asian Indians have a mean fasting glass of glucose, it is elevated. And the most crucial point is that the Pima Indians are insulin resistant, the classical model of type 2 diabetes, when compared to Asian Indians, while the Asian Indians have got less of the insulin secretion, about half to third in, 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 in studies. So this brings us to what is we call the heterogeneity of type 2 diabetes. So you've got two populations. In one population, it is, it is the metabolic load, the increased metabolic load, which is, it results in decreased insulin uh, action. This is the classical Western model. This is associated with adiposity, physical inactivity, dietary factors, two are glucose, and, and you've got lifestyle and metformin. The model that we are seeing more and more in Indian population is of decreased insulin secretions. The factors are unknown. It could be epigenetics, perigenetics, poor maternal child nutrition. I just saw the name of Ranjan Yachnik uh, in, in, in your list of speakers who's done some amazing amount of work on this area, which is reduced beta cell mass. And you're talking about fasting, blood plasma glucose, and maybe the treatments are different. <clears throat> So now let us try to understand how we stratify diabetes currently. So when somebody presents with new presentation of hyperglycemia, which is high glucose, the possibilities are it could be Modi, it could be type 1 diabetes, it could be pancreatic type 3 C diabetes, which is coming quite well, it could be others, or it could be in most people type 2 diabetes. As you would see, type 2 diabetes is mostly a diagnosis of exclusion. As we don't have any test that will allow us to conclusively say, yes, you have type 2 diabetes. So this is my bucket of who is in the type 2 diabetes bucket. One is the genetic for type 1 diabetes that's been misdiagnosed. And then we see a lot of patients with LADA. These are 10 patients who have got LADA, but because they don't develop ketoacidosis, they have been put into the type 2 bucket. Then we have got a middle-aged or old uh, at onset, overweight or obese, minority ethnic groups, um, greater than compared to white populations. So these are bona fide type 2 diabetes patients. And finally, we have got the atypical type of 2 diabetes. So people who are different in some way, but don't have other types of diabetes. So when we talk about atypical type 2 diabetes, it is the type 2 diabetes that doesn't fit our expected mold. But what we need to understand is the mold has been defined on predominantly historical features in white European population. Early onset type 2 diabetes is actually normal for some ethnic groups like the South Asians. So what is the difference between a textbook versus real, real life? So what the textbook tell us is you have got type 2 diabetes. This is associated with increasing age, increasing BMI. And then we have got type 1 diabetes, usually happening at a younger age and associated with lower BMIs. 
But what is actually true is, is something like this, that there is a lot of overlap between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So you can have somebody with type 1 diabetes presenting in their 50s or 60s. I had a patient presenting in 90s with, with, with a proper type 1 diabetes. Similarly, more and more type 1 diabetes are becoming more obese. Similarly, we are seeing more type 2 diabetes occurring in a far younger populations at a far lower BMIs. So one of the biggest dri drivers of the type 2 diabetes occurring in lean people and young onset is ethnicity and South Asian or Asian Indian ethnicity being one of them. So why is it difficult to classify? So you've got type 1, type 2 and others, and they, they merge like this. And you have got adult onset type 1, preserved insulin secretion, type 2 in lean, ketosusprone type 2, young onset type 2, and ethnicity being an important factor. Now, there have been some very good things, not, not, not patient-based studies, but mainly cohort-driven clusters. This was one that started all present, uh, published in Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology. And this looks at diabetes and risk-based clusters, nearly 15,000 patients, mostly Swedish cohort. And they classified diabetes based on a number of factors into five types, what they call severe autoimmune diabetes, severe insulin deficient diabetes, severe insulin resistant diabetes, mild obesity related diabetes, and mild age related diabetes. In an Indian population, there was this um, uh, publication uh, from uh, Dr. Mohan's group uh, uh, from the INSPIRED study. And they came up with the new unique clusters of type 2 diabetes, uh, diabetes patients in which they have tried to attempt to classify type 2 diabetes in a different, in a different uh, manner that helps to guide treatment. So what are the advantages of these new clusters? So it helps to accurately subclassify diabetes, helps us to plan therapies based on pathophysiologies, and helps to predict prognosis and prevent diabetic complication, and is perhaps a step towards precision diabetes. Now, coming back to C-peptide and how C-peptide can actually help us to solve this is let us understand. So one is a C-peptide that helps us to determine the insulin secretion by the pancreas. And the second one are the pancreatic antibodies. Among the pancreatic antibodies, the two or three antibodies that are good in terms of measures are the glutamate, decarboxylase, or what we call GAT65, and islet antigen, which is IA2, along with the zinc transporter. Uh, these um, are good and have been primarily studied in research stu uh, studies to, to diagnose type 1 diabetes. The role in classification of diabetes is still unclear. So what are the caveats when you're trying to interpret the antibody results? So antibody negative does not exclude type 1 diabetes. Less than complete testing, people from some ethnic groups, uh, including Asian Indians, have low rates of positivity and titters diminish over a period of time. So when are we recommending C-peptide measurements? So this is... Uh, been recommended by a number of societies in the UK. So C-peptides is beyond three years after diagnosis is, is, is a good time. It usually needs to be measured within five hours of eating is recommended. Why is that? It is because the C-peptide levels or the insulin levels are actually determined by by, by, by the food that is eaten. So if you actually have eaten the food and measure the C-peptide postprandially, it may be high or low. Similarly, measuring the blood glucose levels concurrently is extremely important because if the blood glucose level is low for whatever reason, uh, it, 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 maybe in the fasting state of patients having hypoglycemia, then the C-peptide levels will be low. Persistent C-peptide, and this is something very important, persistent C-peptide of greater than 600 suggests type 2 diabetes. 
Uh, and the measurement of C peptide in various studies have led to reclassification in nearly 11%. So what's the best practice for testing antibodies? What's the clinical question? Antibodies should only be measured to support a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, type uh, of type 1 diabetes, and type 1 diabetes is not excluded if antibodies are negative. Clinical suspicion is high, then do not defer uh, insulin treatment and start the treatment if you're suspecting type 1 diabetes. Clinical suspicion is low. Why measuring? Have a clear clinical question in mind. And clinical sub suspicion is intermediate and antibody positive. This is supportive of type 1 diabetes. What is a normal C peptide? So there are no normal ranges defined for C peptide, no robustly robustly evaluated cutoff that delineates one type from another and not interpretable at the diagnosis. And this is something very, very important. <clears throat> Let me give you a case um, that presented in my clinic. So this is a 19 year old female in college in Birmingham of Bangladeshi ethnicity, BMI is about 23. She presented with two weeks of tiredness, polyuria and feeling thirsty. Mother has type 2 diabetes on insulin and mother checked her blood glucose capillary level of the daughter and was greater than 18 millimoles per liter. The question is, what treatment should be started on? So in, in the clinical decision about the treatment based on risk, what we want to know is we don't want to miss type 1 diabetes and delay insulin whilst awaiting specialist test. She's young, but she's not overweight. She is UK born Asian person, so she appears to have same risk of type 1 diabetes. And sometimes diabetes classification may take time beyond the results of immediate specialist test. We started on BD Levamy and Novorapid. That's the standard treatment that we give for, for patients diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And three weeks later, her GAD IA2 and ZN T8 antibodies came negative. The question is, would you re-evaluate the diagnosis now? We also know that we get antibody negative type 1 diabetes and, and we need time to see how it involves and C-peptide will help further down the line. We also can consider monogenic diabetes or, or, or MODI. Uh, the family history is compelling and we could proceed towards the genetic tense thing or this could just be early onset type 2 diabetes. We checked her C-peptide levels. They came back elevated at 1,056 picomoles uh, per liter. At the concurrently, her glucose at that time was 8, and her HbA1c was 48. We also did mod modigenetic testing, and no mutation in known modi genes was identified. She currently remains on basal insulin, but the plan is to introduce her on orals. So this is classified as a typical only onset diabetes that we are seeing more and more in the South Asian in, uh, or Asian Indian populations. So what's the summary of early onset type 2 diabetes? So it's a diagnosis of diabetes less than 40 years of age. Could be type 2 diabetes, but the chances of type 1 diabetes in Modi are much higher compared to the later onset of diabetes. We need to practice clinical due diligence and ask ourselves questions. Could it be type 1? Could it be Modi? Can be overweight and have type 1 diabetes and specialist tests are available. Early onset type 2 diabetes is extremely high risk state, so we have it, so it is very important that we have a clarity about the diagnosis. In young adults, uh, there is no 100% accurate diagnosis. Some blood tests may be supported. Age, body mass index are still the two most important factors that are most likely to influence diabetes. Age and BMI are now increasingly poor at discriminating the diabetes subtypes. These are some of the factors where you will differentiate between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. 
Uh, keto acidosis is very important, but we also need to be aware that we are seeing more and more of ketosis prone type 2 diabetes. Now, this is uh, a chart that has been uh, uh, actually developed by inputs from the ESD and have been adapted in the UK. So this is a flow of chart of suspected type 1 diabetes in newly diagnosed adults based on data from white European population. This I need to stress is from white European populations. So if you have got an adult with suspected type 1 diabetes, then you test the islet cell, islet cell antibodies. If the islet cell antibodies are positive, then it is very clear that this is type 1 diabetes. If they are negative, which we know happens in 5 to 10 percent, percent of type 1 diabetes patients, then we look at the age. Is the age less than 35 years or greater than 35 years? If it's less than 35 years, the questions ask, are there features of monogenic diabetes like family history? If the answer is yes, you check or test C-peptide levels. If it's greater than 200, then genetic testing for monogenic diabetes is available. If it is less than 200, then you can safely say that this is type 1 diabetes. If the features of monogenic diabetes are not available, uh, are not there, then we'll really ask the questions, are there features of type 2 diabetes? And the answer is no, then we can say it's type 1 diabetes. If the age is greater than 35 years and you unclear classifications and makes clinical decision as to how person with diabetes should be treated, consider C-peptide test after three years. If it's less than 200, it is type 1 diabetes. If it's between 200 to 600, it's indeterminate. And if it's greater than 600 picomoles per liter, then you can safely say this is type 2 diabetes. Genetic testing uh, is usually done for monogenic diabetes. There is a very excellent Modi probability calculator developed by the Exeter University by Andrew Hattersley and his group, which is easily available online where you can put a number of uh, factors and that gives the risk of this being Modi and suggests whether the, the person needs uh, genetic testing or not. So, Mr. Chairman, in summary, uh, diabetes has a genetic basis and coming years, our understanding has improved and continues to get better. Diagnosis is diabetes correctly, especially in an ethnic or a South Asian population, is becoming important as it will help us to target treatments. Measuring genetic mutations in C-peptide will help, help us in the classification along with new tools that are being developed. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much.